will have He Yi Chu to tell us about the um the second lecture of the higher category series. Uh, thank you, Hannah, uh, for introducing me. Uh, so today's lecture is going to be a continuation uh, of yesterday's talk. So it's still going to be the one category zero of infinity categories. So yesterday's talk was uh, mostly uh, on the definitions, basic definitions of the count. Well, basic concepts, right? Today, we're hopefully I'm gonna show you like a flavor of what type of the a flavor of the proofs that's usually used, even just to prove some something one categorical uh, about infinity categories. So first, let me address uh, the problem I had yesterday. So and I will make it uh, as also an introduction, uh, a selling point for today's talk. You'll see. So. Yes, I, I was confused by my own definition of phase operators and degeneracy operators. So uh, just to be clear, like what I, what I had for the actual assignment of the maps were correct, but I had the domain and co-domain switched possibly for both of them or to at least one of them. So that's, that was the uh, um, source of the confusion. And of course, if you understand the notation, like there's no ambiguity from the source and target. Um, but really what I was thinking about and was not uh, didn't, was not clear about, uh, was not the fact that um, because a single set is a pre sheaf category, so it's contravariant as a functor. It's a pre sheaf sorry, not pre sheaf category. Uh, so it's contravariant as a functor. Uh, so that means well, I would prefer to think about the simplicial operators as uh, acting on cells from, from the right. So that kind of, if I want to denote this map, it's really an F upper star. But as we know, uh, if you take an, a first course in algebraic topology, you know, say for instance, the phase operator DI is supposed to go from delta n minus one to delta n, right? Because it, it's include uh, this, lower uh, dimensional syntax as, uh, 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 as a phase right, of the higher uh, dimensional syntax. So here I write top uh, to decorate this is the uh, original topological synthesis. Right. So you might be wondering, is there like a uh, incongruency between the two? So the short answer is no. And uh, the reason I didn't realize it was because I didn't really think it through uni dilemma. So the short answer is, if you plug in, uh, say, delta, uh, well, here I do have the indices wrong a little bit. Like here, I want this n to be a minus one, and this delta, this x to be delta n for, for it to work out. The simplicial operator really should be considered as an object in here. So like a, um, a minus one, n minus one cell of the standard n syntax. So um, um, so the so the update I mentioned for this lecture notes Hannah has uh, uploaded for me um, had these two extra pages of uh, as appendix. So I said like what I just said was basically this comment. Um, and well, I said I would be able to use this example as a motivation for today's talk. So here it goes. So if you ever uh, try proving uh, your data lemma yourself, just one kind of work on it. That's what I'm writing down. So the E, the, the, the right, so the content of your data lemma is that you have this uh, bijection between natural transformations uh, from, well, uh, the, 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 the pre sheaf represented by X and the functor F, so the set of natural isomorphisms from this home set into the, uh, the value of F at this representing object X, right? And then you define the forward direction sort of by just evaluating at the identity morphism uh, of X, right? And then, so I'm not gonna belabor, like I'm not gonna go through the detail as to how, like uh, what the inverse is because it's a little bit mouthful for me to say, but notice that when you wanna prove this result, you just produce a inverse. What you really did is that you write down an assignment um, Pointwise, so by pointwise, I just meant for each a in this uh, fx, you just write down what your candidate natural isomorphism, well, your candidate inverse of phi x is supposed to be, right? So that's 
what I would call point-wise uh, isomorphism. And you check that indeed, you know, phi x composed with phi, phi is um, uh, identity and then the other way around, right? Uh, um, so what we really just show is an inverse, but we're gonna say it as the inverse because inverses uh, in one category uh, is unique. Well, they are unique, right? So it suffices to define them point-wise. But it's not the uh, it's not the same for infinity categories, right? And so what I mentioned uh, in this remark was really related to what I was saying uh, on the previous page. So uh, if you check the notations um, for, like, say, between uh, Jacob Jacob Ruth Caradon and also say uh, my advisor Charles Ruth's uh, notes, they have different uh, notations for this phase and. Uh, degeneracy operators in the sense that Jacob Lurie in Caradon use lower, uh, use subscripts, so lower I, but Charles and also I used uh, upper I superscripts uh, in the in the previous slides. So what I've just explained both, like there, there's reason behind uh, both of these notations, right? So uh, Charles is, is considering the operators as uh, oper like acting on the right of a cell and uh, Jake Lewis was uh, considering them through the, the lens of Yoneda lemma. Right. Now let's go back to today's talk. Right. So I was, uh, what I was saying was, well, what I was saying was really uh, this part of the remark. Right. So what I what we meant by pointwise isomorphism, like we have a pointwise inverse phi of well phi of phi. So that's how I'm gonna distinguish them. Then, distinguish them. Uh, so the point the point is that if you have a natural natural transformation alpha, uh, so of course it's it has assignments object wise. So to produce an inverse, what you do is just uh, object wise the uh, value of the candidate inverse natural transformation is just going to be uh, inverse object wise, right? And this inverse is well defined because inverses are unique in one category, in one categories. But as we saw yesterday, right, conversations are not necessarily unique and inverses are not necessarily unique. They're only unique up to uh, homotopy because that's how we define it. So now uh, what you might be wondering is that do I have this pointwise isomorphism of natural, transforma natural transformations for infinity for quasi categories? The answer is surprisingly yes, but there are uh, obviously two, at least two difficulties in sight. So first is what we mentioned. So inverse of an edge, inverse of any morphism. Uh, oh wait, I think there's a type, there's a typo, right? Uh, my candidate, the value of the candidate inverse natural transformation is just object-wise inverse. Um, right, so what I just explained was the first difficulty at uh, for one cells, right? So inverse of edges are not necessarily unique, but also like say if you've even considered defining, you've even considered <laughs> that you've defined uh, this natural isomorphism right right on uh, dimension zero and dimension one, you still have higher dimensions to to take care of, right? So, but it's kind of surprising that you still have the uh, pointwise uh, uh, natural isomorphism theorem for, um, uh, for infinity categories. And then you might be asking, what's the proof of that? So um, we're gonna see, I'm not gonna be able to prove the you put the detail of that theorem or even tell you about the ingredient for that theorem, but we're gonna see some kind of flavor of it. Yeah, uh, so um, right. some of the basic questions we can answer is that uh, in uh, David Gardner's talk today, he obviously mentioned the fact that there's a functor category uh, in infinity categories. So right now what, right, a, a good question to ask is why like, how do you know that the obvious definition for functor simplicial simplicial set is actually a as is actually an infinity category, right? Right. So this is my uh, this is a statement for the infinity uh, point like the the the, the pointwise criterion for isomorphisms in infinity category. So that's a statement, right? So what I was just saying is that how do I even know this is an internal uh, 
function category, right? And then, but at least this one uh, is going to be a corollary of some, well, I shouldn't say a corollary of our big theorem today, but it's going to be a corollary of what we do today. I'm going to fix it uh, later. Uh, and filling the details. And also, uh, since David Gaffney kind of mentions, mentions this uh, when he was about to introduce uh, presentable infinity one categories, he mentioned, well, uh, there's an infinity categorical version of Yoneda embedding, right? So what, what, would that, what would that generalization be? So uh, as you probably know, right, this countervariant functions are uh, pre-sheaves, right, on the C with values in uh, sets. So the infinity categorical generalization we want to consider uh, is to, uh, uh, when, right, when, when we're going to plug in an infinity category C, and then the infinity categorical generalization of the pre-sheaf, we're going to replace sets by uh, the one category of sets by infinity category of infinity group points. Uh, I think David Gardner used a uh, group lower, uh, uh, group void lower infinity, right, in his uh, talk, but I'm just going to use S because that's the one I like, right? And then the notice that this fact uh, is an easy corollary of the point-wise criterion for isomorphism one categorically. So, right, you just basically uh, plug in, well, sorry, this is really a corollary of a one categorical Yoneda, la Yoneda lemma, right? And then what you do is you just um, plug in this pre-sheaf for the second fun the general function f and evaluate that pre-sheaf at x right so and what you what this statement amounts to say is that uh, the category c embeds fully faithfully into the pre-sheaf of c right and then this is the assignment right so now we set generalization of the pre-sheaf on c right so first if c is an infinity category we want to do things nicely so that the pre-sheaf is also an infinity category and we're going to replace uh, the home sets, right? Now they can't be home sets because, well, we have even here group points here. Uh, so um, are going to be replaced, replaced by mapping spaces. So then we're going to did talk about this, right? This is uh, uh, the pullback of uh, the, the, the two points X and Y. Well, uh, well. Let, uh, let me not not draw that two backs for so these notes are probably posted by now so you can check um so it's non trivial to actually define this as a functor of infinity categories right why would this even be natural right in in, in those two components and there's a typo obviously i include an op right so, right okay so wait i fix it before anyone of the audience can see it <laughs> So that's great. So we get, we do have an infinity category called Yoneda in that. So now that I've motivated today's lecture, I'm actually going to go into the, uh, how, to, how do I say, get our hands dirty and look at what kind of proofs we're facing, right? So the first one is going to be a easier slide. So how do we even define, right? Remember, I still haven't defined what it means to have a function function simplicial set between two simplicial sets. So I'm going to use the word, a uh, user terminology Charles, Charles uses. So function complex, because like we use subcomplex for like sub objects of simplicial set, right? I don't want to say this is a quality category just yet. So I want to say it's a function complex. So the definition is kind of straightforward. So the n cells in this function complex is going to be the hum sets uh, in simplicial sets. Uh, from this product delta n cross x, remember we show that this is a simplicial set into y, right? And then the the action of uh, uh, a simplicial operator is obvious, right? So just goes here, right? So now if you like plug in n equals zero and n equals one here, you can see that the vertices are precisely the hum sets, right? So so right if you plug in uh, like n equals zero, like this goes away, right? You get precisely the harm set, right? And uh, vertices are precisely in the harm set. And the morphisms in the simplicial set uh, is what we defined yesterday, uh, natural transformations. So natural transformations between functors is like a edge between functors, right? So that's good. And we actually have the, uh, the function complex construction giving us a functor. So everything here is still one categorical. So there's no 
uh, from, as I mentioned, for the mapping space. Yeah. Um, right. And then you, in fact, have the subjunction between product and the function complex, uh, basically because right, you start with the dimension zero, uh, you have the dimension zero statement, right? And then for each dimension and statement, you still you can still move things around the same way as you did for the dimension zero thing, and then use your main lemma. And then just by some kind of uh, formal uh, formal argument, and also the fact that the nerve of the we talk about this yesterday, right? The nerve of bracket n is precisely the uh, representing object, the center and simplex, and also nerve preserved products, etc. You can show that function between nerves is the nerve of the function complex. So that's a big question here. So how do I know uh, when a function complex is a quality category? It's an infinity category. Well, the answer is lifting properties. So remember, we defined a quality category to uh, by uh, having the the inner horn extension property, right? It's a lifting problem. So it makes sense that the actual proofs we're gonna see use it, it's about solving some type some type of lifting problems, right? So let me first review uh, uh, some of the terminologies. This you might have seen. So say if we have a good category, uh, say simputial set. Um, Simple sets. Uh, a weakly saturated class is a class of morphisms uh, that contains isomorphism and is closed under co base change. So, co base changes here. So, if f is in A, f prime is in A. Right. Transfinite composition. So, I showed how the definition of transfinite composition. Uh, co products, this is going to be implied by the previous two, and also retracts. Right. So, the actual definition is not important, just saying, like, you know, weakly saturated class. A weekly saturated class has good properties um, for uh, applications to lifting problems. So, and then for any class of maps S, I'm just going to use the closure notation to say uh, to denote the weak saturation. So that's the smallest weekly saturated class containing the set itself. Okay. So now let me state what we mean by a lifting problem. So uh, you start by fixing, uh, maybe let's just look at the square. So you start by fixing these two uh, maps, right? And then uh, you can fill in the, the, the two horizontal edge edges, right? So uh, we can, um, right? So this, this commutative square poses a, a lifting, poses a lifting problem for F and G, right? So like, I want to think about U and V as like, um, uh, how do I say flexible and it can be changed. So like for each fixed pair of F and G, I might be changing U and E's, right? And then uh, we solve the lifting problem. So that means producing a lift if there's an S in the middle making this diagram commute. Okay. So uh, uh, if um, for every such um, commutative square, I can produce a lift, I say, like I use this notation. F, like this is precisely lifting, right? That, that shape of the diagram. So like for every pair of UME so that this commutes, you can solve, you can find a um, lift here. Then we say F lifts G. So I'm just gonna read it as lift. So another way of saying this is that you have the surjective maps between, uh, surjective map, surjective map between hump sets, right? So one of them is, right? So you have one of them is, uh, induced by post composing with G, the other one is induced by uh, pre composing with F. And then you send S to um, S compose with G and F as pre composed with F. Right. So uh, we also write like um, as classes, right? A lift B if every morphism lifts. Yeah. So this is our notation. So the important uh, um, class of maps we want to say, uh, we want to mention is a right complement and left complement. So it's defined by what you think it is, right? So uh, the right complement is a, is a class of maps so that it lifts any morphisms in, in this class A. And then similarly, we have the left complement. Right? So it, for any A morphisms A in big A, you, you can put F on the left. So that F lift. So it's a standard 
uh, argument uh, that shows both these continents are weakly saturated. And there's some kind of fun fact, uh, right? So uh, what I guess what's really important is just this one, obviously. So if you have to lift fewer morphisms, right, your complement is bigger, right? Because this one lifts fewer morphisms, right? Same thing go, goes the, the other way, right? right? Like it's still contain, contain. Okay. So now let me say, right? So I'm not gonna, it's still a famous argument. Uh, that shows that, um, um, say, let S be any set of morphism in simple sets, then we have a, a weak uh, factorization system. So here, by weak factorization system, like made up from S, uh, we meant any any morphism in, in simple set can be factored by a morphism here, followed by a morphism here. And also, these are each other's complement, right? So this is, uh, right complement of this one, and this is a left complement of that one. Okay. Right, so the direction goes left. Right. So we've seen a basic example, uh, projective modules. Yeah, I'm not gonna be there by the point and go through too much detail in here, right? So now let us let me talk about some of the important class uh, of morphisms in simple sets. So recall last time we defined uh, inner horns, right? So inner horns is any uh, horn that looks where like the, the opposite vertex J is not zero and then, right? So a inner horn, the only inner horn in dimension two is, looks like that, right? So uh, I'm just gonna use the notation we had before. So uh, the saturated class of, the weakly saturated class of inner, the weak saturation of inner horns uh, we give them names inner anodyne, right? And then it's right complement, um, right? This is a right complement of that by the small object argument. Uh, we are gonna call them inner vibrations. So this is by, by the small object ar argument, we do have a weak factorization system, given by inner anodynes and inner vibrations. So if you unpack the definition, right? Remember, uh, a a, a simple set is an infinity category if it has a you know, core uh, lifting property. So that corresponds precisely to the fact that C lifts against any you know, horns, right? So that's equivalent basically by definition. Right? So here, like I'm writing out Y. Right? Okay, uh, so uh, let's talk about some of the, uh, some of the examples here. So, uh, examples of inner inner anodynes and also uh, like basic ap application of the lifting properties, right? So uh, so we you do have something called generalized horn. So instead of deleting once, well, instead of S here being one uh, vertex, you can actually have any set of vertices, right? So it's gonna be a inner anodyne, right? Uh, inclusion of Sub infinity categories uh, are inner vibrations, right? And then you have this property for mapping into ordinary category. And you also you also have the fact that uh, any anodyne inner anodyne map uh, induces uh, uh, isomorphism in homotopy categories, right? So here I kind of read out the proof. You're gonna have to use the universal property of the homotopy category construction we talked about last time. Okay, so now. Right, uh, I'm gonna need to define another set of uh, weak factorization systems. So remember, we just defined inner anodyne and inner vibrations. So these are the weak saturation of inner horns, and this is the right complement, right? So we're gonna define another. Uh, so the maps are easy to define. So uh, for each standard n syntax, you have the boundary of the n syntax, right? So it's, Right, you're taking the union of all the co-dimension one faces, right? Because here you're you start with n plus one vertices and you delete each, you just did a one phase, and then that's the delta and minus one. Right. And then this these are the uh, k-dimensional cells of the boundary of the boundary uh, of uh, n simplex. And also uh, delta zero, ah, sorry. Uh, the boundary of delta zero is empty. 
And then right, this is another calculation of the boundary. So it's the largest sub complex, uh, proper sub complex, because the only phase it's missing is sort of the interior of the standard and syntax. Right. So we're going to call the set of, uh, I'm going to call um, the inclusion uh, of boundary into the spin syntax itself. Uh, um, cellular inclusions or just cell inclusions, right? Because it, it is in inclusion of the um, code match one phases. So I'm going to call them cell inclusions. Uh, and I'm going to denote all the cell inclusions by cell, right? And then trivial vibrations are going to be the right counting. So if you are um, familiar with model structure, and also I recall what David Gapner mentioned, um, these are called trivial vibrations precisely because they are the trivial vibrations in the Joyal model structure. But I'm not going to be able to fully describe, say, uh, the vibrations of that model structure. So <laughs> that's a problem. And also, you know that since this is the trivial vibrations, or, or uh, I think people also use the term uh, terminology as cyclic vibrations, right? Uh, since this is the left, uh, like cell is a left complement of tree five. Uh, these are the co-fibrations of that Joyal model structure you put on sequential sets. Yeah, but when we're actually going to be able to talk about the uh, weak equivalences. So, yeah. spoiler alert. <laughs> so, um, notice that uh, all of these cell inclusions are uh, monomorphisms. They are injected. So we obviously have this. Uh, um, Inclusion, and you can show that the right hand side, the class of all uh, monomorphisms in symmetric sets are actually weakly saturated, right? So then, like, we can put weak saturations on both sides, but the right hand side is fine. So we have all the cell inclusions are uh, the weak saturation of cell inclusions are subsets of class of uh, monomorphisms. And in fact, right, you might be wondering is there a converse? Yes, the converse holds. And in fact, we do have uh, this. I do have this fact here. And um, uh, what it what uses is the what's called a skeletal filtration. So uh, for each um, simplicial set X, you can define its case, case skeleta, right? And it's given by uh, this formula. And you do have, like, let's not unpack what, right? Basically, you're just looking at the image of. Um, cells under simplicial operators only up to this k here. Right? But, but let's say like the usual properties you would expect um, uh, skeletons to hold, do hold, right? So, um, right. so uh, a, com a common, so the reason I want to mention this uh, is that this is the common technique uh, that's used um, in some of the basic proofs of uh, about quality categories. So when these are used, um, uh, my brother Charles would usually say this is a computation uh, because you're basically analyzing uh, each dimension, what happens each dimension. So it's a straight, straightforward thing to do. So you do have this push out. So like, uh, right, so if A is a subcomplex of X, you look at the non degenerate cell, right? You go the, the A union, the K minus one uh, skeleton with the non degenerate cell in dimension K that's not containing A, then you get, uh, well, glued along the set and you get uh, a union, um, the K skeletal facts, and in the end, you will get X, right? Uh, so I think as this is not a, this is a, a corollary of this fact. So uh, C to the point is a trivial vibration if C is uh, a con complex. Remember, con complex is uh, lifts, uh, it's a sequential set that lives along all, all the horns, not just the inner horns. If it just lives along the, the inner horns, it's a, it's an infinity category, right? So count complex lives along uh, all uh, horn inclusions. So it's a fact. Okay, well, it's actually easy because it's a if it's a trivial vibration, it lives against all mono, mono monomorphisms that in particular include all the horn, horn inclusions. So that's why. Right. Okay. So then what's the actual tech 
what's the actual tool we're going to use in some of the proofs we want to do. So for instance, why is the function complex mapping into an infinite category, a quasi category? Uh, it's called enriched lifting. So for F, G, and H, uh, we define a pushout product. Sometimes I just read it as box product to be the uh, the unique map fitting in this pushout diagram in simplicial set. So it's still one categorical, so it's unique, right? So, right, I've written out uh, the maps here. And then the pushout, the pushout home, uh, H, like, I might, I might say it's a pullback of a H along G here. So it's this uh, unique map fitting into this pullback diagram, right? So it's H because H, like I say H pullback along G because H is a post -compo composition and this is the pre-composition. Right? So notice that this is not symmetric, right? right? So it's a similar fact of that lifting, it's similar it's similar to what we said about the lifting column. So the the fact that um, right, let me see. Right, on vertices, right, the 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 pullback column is just uh, what we said about the lifting problem has a solution here. Right. And also it's called the enriched lifting because the right hand side kind of, uh, it's a parameterized family of all such uh, commutative squares to be solved. And left hand side is the parameterized family of all the solutions. So that's why we call it enriched lifting. But uh, that's not really important. So what's, what's uh, the most important fact I consider is this fact between um, the push out product and the pullback home. So, is saying like you solving those two uh, lifting problems are equivalent. So uh, maybe I should say how you should see it, right? The trick I learned from my writer, uh, Charles, is that you should always start from the lift, start from the solution. So this F is a map from B cross L to X. So you know it's adjoint uh, is S tilde. Right, so similarly, you can look at F, right, and then et cetera, and G like that. Well, I'm not, I'm not gonna be spell out the, I'm not gonna be spelling out the details. Right? So we call this fact uh, a junction of linking problems, right? Because it kind of feels like that, right? So an important class of examples is you take the, like this K, uh, here to be the empty set. So then like this goes away, right? So then this map, right, is just gonna be F cross L, right? So, and if you take Y to be the point, right, you have this, this proposition implies that this is equivalent to that, right? So notice that we do see a function complex showing up here. So that's gonna be, well, kind of alluding to the proof uh, of why a function complex is an internal object if X is a quality category. Yeah. So as you might be expecting, this two construction does give a uh, close symmetrical monoidal structure on the arrow category of single set, but that's not important. And another lifting property I, uh, I need to talk about is that you kind of have the, uh, the translation between um, the, the pullback harms and uh, push up product like this. So if S push up push up product T is containing U, then right. So here I'm going to use a set followed by five to mean the right vibration. So now if you take the right vibration of the the the, the set on the right and push it push harm along um, uh, one of the set here we're going to get the right complement of the other set, the other class, right? I should, whatever, it says set here, so, yeah. So uh, I'm not going to, um, actually going to be uh, talking about proofs using them, but this is the, the this is indispensable in uh, the, the proof of some of the results we're going to see today. So, and then, you do have this relations between uh, uh, inner anodized and monomorphic 
more known, more freedoms. Right? And then by this corollary, you have this result. So remember, trivial fibrillation is the right complement of monomorphisms, and uh, inner fibrillation is the right complement of uh, inner analyze. Okay, so now we can, uh, I'm claiming that uh, we get this fact. So if C is any, uh, C is a quality category and L is a simplicial set, then the function complex between them uh, is gonna be a quality category, right? So the reason is that this is a inner horn, uh, and this is a inner anodyne, right? And this, well, inner horn in particular, and this is a monomorphism, right? So it lives, uh, it lives against uh, inner fibrations. So now by the uh, adjunction in lifting, pro uh, lifting problems, you have this fact. But remember, we just said uh, this being a right. But 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 this is a definition, right, for this function complex to be a quality category, just said in a different way, right? For right, formulated in a different way, right? Another fact uh, that we're uh, I'm gonna use uh, is that if you have a you know inner anodyne map or a more no more no injective morphism, then uh. The restriction function it induces, and now I've I've got to switch. Sorry. The restriction function on uh, function uh, ca uh, function categories is going to be a trivial vibration or inner vibration. So these corresponds to each other. So they are switched by the the, the these properties. Yeah. So. And then I'm not gonna. Uh, I'm probably I'm probably not gonna have time about this, but uh, you can actually um, you actually have an improvement of the statement, but that's not spend too much time on that. So uh, what like another um, fact I want to say uh, using this lifting properties is composition. So remember yesterday we said composition in infinity categories is only unique up to uh, homotopy, right? Because Right. This is well defined, but like there are many classes, right? In this, in this equivalence class, uh, in this equivalence class, so they are all considered uh, compositions of GNF. But in fact, we can do a little bit, little bit better. So to start, uh, we have every trivial vibration in the section. Say if H here is a trivial vibration, it lives in particular against this monomorphism. This is injective, right? And if I put identity here. Right, I've produced a section. Right, that's what it means to have a section. Right, and then so now what we want to do is um, maybe let's start by looking at uh, this. Right, so uh, maybe it's better if I draw like a two syntax again. Right, remember what we said yesterday basically is that uh, if you have a two cell that, that let me label as alpha, the third edge is what we want to consider as a composite, right? So, right, so um, this, the, the two composable morphisms, right, is, a, uh, is an element in this function complex, right? And the third edge is, right, this is a zero, two edge, right, zero, one, two. This is a zero, two edge, right? The third edge is an element in here. So we do want to define a function, a, a functor, from this function complex into this function complex, right? So uh, uh, we do have the, um, right? So to start, we don't really have a fun function that goes this way, but we do have a zigzag. So this inner horn restriction, right? So this is the, uh, the horn one, two, right? Induces these, res these restrictions, right? So, um, how do I define the composable uh, the composition functor? I just pick right by what we just showed, um, uh, right by the by one of the lifting properties. Uh, this, both of these restrictions are trivial vibrations, right? So, in particular, this one is a trivial vibration, but by this fact here, it does have a it does have a section, right? So I'm just gonna say the composition functor uh, is. R prime composed with our choice of sections, right? You're gonna, right, and in general, it generalizes. So I haven't really defined the spine. So let me just say in general, it um, generalized to unfold composition, right? 
So, uh, but uh, right, you might say, you know, this section is not necessarily unique, but what we will be able to show uh, uh, with, uh, in the next few slides is that the composition is defined up to natural isomorphism, not just up to uh, homotopy, up to homotopy. And this is also, this fact is really, uh, sometimes you see people saying unique up to a contractible space of choice. Uh, this is one of those situations. Right? And you're gonna see why. Okay. Uh, and to, to, uh, to um, prove that fact, I have to talk about the weak equivalences in the model category of the Joyo model category, <laughs> in the Joyo model category of single sets. So um, it's gonna be a little bit convoluted. So let, let me start first by uh, defining what it means uh, for a functor between infinity categories to have a category categorical inverse. It is what you think it is. So the compo the, the the composition it's another functor so that the comp composition two ways are isomorphisms up to homotopy. Right. This is what we defined. Right? Uh, up to homotopy in the homotopy category of the function uh ca function category. Right. So the reason that you might be asking why am I ref like um restricting to quality categories, uh, it is because um, uh, right, we only have a very good control of the homotopy category of the infinity category. That's what I was defining yesterday. So you do have a fundamental category of zero set, but we only had a good control for homotopy category of quasi categories. So uh, I can't just, right, because this natural isomorphisms are defined up to homotopy. So right now I have to restrict to the quality categories. So what, then you are going to ask, what, what's, a, what's a categorical inverse between zero sets? So we do have this fact. Uh, we do have this definition. So for any infinity category, E, so now these two are actually going to be quasi categories, right? The restriction functor has a category, has a categorical inverse, right? So th this is a valid application of this definition, right? So you're gonna ask, you know, I seem to have two definitions for categorical inverses between quality categories, and indeed they coincide. Right? So I'm not gonna uh, say why, but they coincide for uh, functions between quality categories. And uh, the 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 concept of co uh, of uh, categorical inverse has a lot of variants, and they're kind of all um, um, equivalent to each other. And I want to mention, I'm writing this here because this is a definition Cardon, uh, Jacob Lure use, uses in Cardon. So hopefully he doesn't do any future updates, but I, don't, I doubt he would, right, to, to that. So this is a definition Jacob Lure uh, used. To, I haven't really talked about maximal subgroup point, but it's a generalization of the one group point in one category, right? And, uh, but let me say, like, these two are not that different. So at least we, we, we can, right? The real difficult uh, direction here is this one, or this one, yeah. Okay, uh, so right, remember, you, remember I said, these are supposed to be the weak equivalences um, in the draw model category, uh, in the draw model structure. These are supposed to be the, the cyclic fibrations or trivial fibrations by their name suggests. So you would expect them to be, you will expect this, right? And indeed, uh, this this fact holds. So what I want to do is not to actually talk about the proof, but the proof contains uh, a very important um, uh, result, right? So if here, right, if say we're given a trivial fibration, if here like the 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 the, the codomain is actually just a tree, uh, it's just delta zero, the terminal object. The terminal simplicial set, then this P is actually a categorical inverse exhibiting X as a contractible con complex. Right. Right. So first, it's a categorical equivalence, and also X would necessarily be a space. Oh, sorry, would necessarily be a con complex, right? And it's going to be contractible. Like the fact that X is going to be a con complex is not difficult to show. Um, uh, it requires some effort to show these, but there it's not the most difficult result. And just as remember, I said post composing is a particular type of vibrations. If the map, sorry, pre composing, right? What I was referring to was 
uh, this fact, right? We have a singular fact for post composing, but that's not important. So um, what I'm gonna, well, I'm gonna, uh, the reason I'm saying that is that the third ingredient of this proof uh, actually justified the statement, right? Together with the first one. So um, another way of thinking about sections is that they kind of live in as live as a fiber of the identity morphism over the post composing with P map, right? So they are the right. They're the fiber of the identity map uh, over the post composing map, right? So these two, because right now notice that I, I'm not assuming X and X are quasi categories. So uh, these are not necessarily quasi categories, but this this is right by uh, this fact. Yeah. So and also because th this is a pull, right? The, the reason this is a trivial fabrication is because it's a pullback of the trivial fabrication, and you do have to lift the right com right complement thing, right? So now the space of sections is now well. Sections lives in a contractible com complex, right? So now, by the big theorem we're gonna prove today, the Joyal, uh, the the, the Joyal lifting theorem, a com complex is a space or an infinity group. Right? So that's why people said it. So just replace that with com complex here. Yeah, that's what people meant. Right. So now, the composition function I defined was indeed unique up to natural isomorphisms, right? Or up to uh, categorical well, I said what I said. All right, so I I think I'm going way over time, so let me not talk about this. So you do have some uh, categorical equivalences from the free, like the the nerve of the free mount weight is categorically were categorically equivalent to the sintetical uh, circle, and you, and you have the unfold unfold generalization of that by lifting probably. Okay, so now we finally get to join, and hopefully we can talk about slices. Um, so uh, David Gaffner kind of already talked about some of this, so that kind of justify why I'm uh, going over this. But let me say that a join is already defined on the for one category. So for two categories, the join of them A star B. So the objects are just going to be the union of their objects. The morphisms. It's written this way. So now, right, if the 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 um, if x and y are uh, objects of A, so the morphism stays the same, same, same if they are both objects in B. But if x is in A and y is in B, there's a unique morphism connecting them, and otherwise empty. Right, and then you do have the left cone and right cone. Uh, Defined by adjoining freely, the left cone is defined by freely adjoining an initial object. The right cone is uh, defined by uh, adjoining a terminal object. I, say, I should say initial object, I probably said it wrong. And then let me say there's some kind of technique. We're going to uh, generalize this definition of join to uh, simplicial sets. So um, let me say there's, uh, let me say I want to. Uh, how do I say? I want to dis define an order disjoint union uh, on the uh, the well the simplicial operator category so that it plays well uh, with join. Right. So um, so let me just say what it is. So if a morphism uh, maps to uh, the destroy union of two uh, totally ordered finite sets, the morphism um, decomposes into two parts, right? So P decomposes into two parts. So now uh, here's the definition of joining of two synthesis. So it's kind of a convolution product, right? So um, a, a, an NCO here, right? It's any uh, N1, well, the, the, the product of a N1 dimensional cell in X cross the um, Dimension n two cell in Y, so that a one and n two uh, make up of n, right? And then simplicial operators uh, act in the ways you expect, and you do need to use this order destroy union fact uh, to talk about the 
action of the sin control operators. And noted every one of the lowest dimensional cells, notice that that's precisely this formulation, right? And then just as uh, David, and then you get obviously like X includes into the uh, join along the like the leftmost component, and then Y include as a rightmost component. So you have this fact, right, uh, of sub complexes. Um, but uh, notice that the join uh, is not symmetric uh, because I guess at least it's not natural. Right? So you can define them like uh, at least dimension by dimension, but they're not natural. Right. And the important fact to note that uh, is the join of two synthesis, uh, standard and synthesis synthesis. It's a new uh, standard and synthesis syntax, but notice that you are adding one in the middle, right? I add one in the middle because right, if you write out what it is, it's actually adding in the middle. Right. Well, yeah, yeah. You can consider it as adding, adding in the middle, right? And then you can define left cone and right cone similar to the left cone and right cone for one category, right? So this is a nerve of the bracket zero category, right? And then, uh, the joint construction play well with nerves. Right? So let me give a picture of uh, a specific type of joint. So say a, a cone. So say uh, the boundary of delta one is just these two vertices, right? So now if you want to join uh, a point, join a, a, a terminal cone point, terminal cone point, right? You just connect them with the, right? And similarly, well, you have a, a right horn of dimension two. And now if you want to join an initial object, you get the, well, the left cone. Well, did I say that way? You get a cone in the other direction. And this actually exhibit delta one cross delta one as a co-limit of, well, I haven't, I haven't said, said it, right? I haven't showed, well, I haven't said the fact necessary to just write that statement. But anyway, so, uh, there's some fact that says join of quality categories uh, is a is a quality category, okay. and it uses the observ observation of mapping into joints. Okay, so now let me define uh, what it means to be a slice. Right. So for any p uh, x goes uh, s goes into x, the slice under right, the reason is called slice under is because it's under anything is under p here. The slash is under p. So the slice under simplicial set uh, is one so that the n cells are defined as such, right? So this is a join we just talked about, right? So kind of dually, you have the slice over category. So here you are, notice that the map still, right? So it still goes to X, but you're switching like the, 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 the order of the join. Remember join is not symmetric. So uh, something that you might expect that that does not hold is that the, the join functor uh, does not preserve co-limits because this is the initial object of the set, but if you join it with X, you get X, not the initial object X. So, but it almost is a left. It almost is a left adjoint and preserve co-limits. So the way to fix that is to consider the simplicial set slice over slice under x, right? And then the assignment, right? What, what is this uh, um, map? It precisely sends p to the slice under category and q to the slice over category. Okay. And you have something called the slice, join slice adjunction, basically by definition, right? So mapping into slice can be interpreted, like this map can be interpreted as this extension of the give a map P here, right? So you can put delta N here and you precisely get the N cells in, N cells of the uh, slice under category, right? Similarly, you have the other way around. Right. Well, and then you have some functorality of slice. Uh, so let me say, if you have a sequence of maps, you, uh, it induces, um, map of slices by post-composing here and pre-composing. 
uh, and notice that this is y and y, not x, right? And there's even a map. Where, well, this is still post-composing. This is still pre-composing. It's only commutative. I'm not saying it's a push out or pull back, right? And then uh, here is me explaining uh, how to understand uh, this fun this functoriality uh, in in the level of cells, basically by using the joint slice adjunction and writing everything out. I feel like I'm going way over time with say you when the, the organizer stops me. Um, right. And then you can use that, you can use this fact to spell out what happens for the obvious sort of forgetful function from the slice over category into a slice over signature set into X yourself. Right. And then the other way around. Oh well, well this is not the other way around. This is um, a generalization. Right, uh, so you see I'm defining something that kind of looks like the push out product. So I'm not gonna talk about these. So um, we're gonna need to show that slice category is a quality, ca a slice category of a quality category is a quality category. So you can think of slice category as a somewhat generalization of the function complex. Like at least in terms of the lifting, a junction of lifting properties. So. Right, previously we had a push out. Oh, I want to quickly find that. Where is the push out product? Right, Pre previously we have this push out product and this pull back home, right? So similarly, we have this push out join and pull back slice, right? And they satisfy similar looking identities. Right. So one of the more important uh, observation you're going to need to use is this set of operations. But let me just say what it is. So the uh, push out join is that like say of uh, uh, a, a horn and a monomorphism like of this particular form is right. You glue like, uh, wait, this is a picture for this. This is a picture, right? This is just a standard two simplex, right? This whole thing is just a standard two simplex, right? This is that. And they're glued along the, the inner horn, right? So green. And indeed, you get the standard three simplex, right? Well, well indeed, you, sorry, you get the uh, left horn, right? The left dimension three horn, because like the low, the lowest, right? The interior is empty and also the map, the face opposite of zero. Uh, is empty, is empty, right? There's no bottom face, right? So this is equivalent to that as subcomplex of uh, delta three, right? So so then right, you analogously you have a pullback slice, etc., etc., etc. Join has nice properties, etc. So because I haven't defined co limits, but David, I'm going to talk about it. So. Uh, let me quickly go through. So as you would uh, expect, uh, um, initial object is a particular kind of co-limit. So, but in the infinity categorical setting, we're just gonna first define initial object and use initial object and slice to define co-limit. So a, the initial object in the quality category C is an object so that it has this lifting property. So this is the cell inclusion. Right, of the standard n syntax mm -hmm. into the boundary of the standard n syntax into the standard n syntax. So if the leading vertex is this x, right, it always emits this this inclusion always emits a lift. Mm -hmm. Then x is the initial object, right? Similarly, you have the terminal object replacing this by n, the last vertex. And now, uh, if um, if you have a map into an infinity category. The co-limit of this map is precisely the initial object in this slice category. So remember, we just showed, well, I just said, <laughs> if C is an infinity category, this uh, slice under category is, is, is a quality category. So that's hence the terminology, right? Right, and then you have some uh, co-limit cones, so which is basically restricting F, uh, different restrictions of F. Well. Let me not say what, what something wrong. And then what you can show elementally is that co-limit and limits are, are defined uniquely, right? 
were really categorically equivalent to the uh, the standard zero syntax, the one point, if it's not empty. Right? That's that's easy. Right? And then this fact requires lifting properties. Uh, right. So let me say go over some time and actually say the Joel extension and lifting properties that lets us to verify a version of the homotopy hypothesis in this model. So yeah, you have this two. Just, oh. Maybe you can just go to the 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 the, the last goal, the goal you want to stay, the yeah, state. Yeah. Of, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Let me just say that this allows you to prove. Right. Last time we showed that if uh, uh, a sequential set is a compact, that means uh, lifting uh, against any horn, uh, then it is necessarily an infinite group point. So every morphism here is an isomorphism in the uh, homotopy category. So we had the this direction. But with Joyal lifting property, uh, with this theorems, you can actually show that the reverse holds. And there are other facts you would like to show that use this. That's also correlated over Joyal lifting. Right. So thank you for listening. <laughs>